Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 32, we're going to take a look at possibly a way to improve your overall stereo system using a simple block diagram. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them, Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Okay, so you're slowly building a nice stereo system. And at first, it sounded totally awesome. Even your partner, your friends, even the dog, agree. But now that the first rush is gone, you've been spending some time listening to it more critically. And, well, it doesn't sound nearly as good as you remember. So what in the heck happened? A couple of things. First, you're getting to know your system and are able to pay more attention to the detail. Whereas when you first fired the thing up, everything was new and your brain could really only absorb the big picture, or should we say the overall sound. And well, I don't like to be a drag on all this fun, but this is a common experience of audiophiles the world over. You get used to that great sound, and you want to improve it even more. So, instead of sitting down in front of your stereo system and listening to test tracks, which is a good thing, why don't you try sitting down in front of your whole system? Drawn out is a block diagram. The advantage to this is you can see everything, including cables. You can follow the signal chain from the beginning to the end, and I guarantee you will find a weak link or three that need attention. Okay, enough blah blah. Let's look at one of my systems. All drawn out. Okay, right at the beginning here I have an analog side, all analog, that's vinyl. And I've marked records with an R-I-A-A-E-Q. What the heck is that? That is the Recording Industry of America Standard Equalization. And what that means is vinyl records, when they're um, when they're mastered and when they're when the lacquer is cut, have their bass frequencies lowered and their high frequency, their treble, increased significantly. And the reason for that is it's really tough to cut a lacquer, cut, cut big low waves on a lacquer. So by lowering, lowering the bass frequencies, um, you make that, that work out much easier. And the reason they boost the high frequencies is because it helps with noise cancellation. And um, even if you could press um, a big... Uh, unequalized uh, bass frequencies onto a record, your stylus would just jump out. So there's a bunch of reasons why they do that. Now I've made a note of that because we're going to have to re reverse the equalization or restore it to its original later on. Okay, let's keep going here. I've got a very affordable but decent quality, I would say very good quality, Project RPM turntable. I like it a lot. It's been in my system, my latest system. Um, since I got back into vinyl. And it actually came with a really uh, decent quality order phone cart that I liked quite a bit, but after a year I wanted something better. I did a lot of research and I found a series of videos, shootouts, on YouTube. Um, this fellow in, I believe he's in Japan, did a bunch of shootouts and he highly recommended uh, this uh, uh, Nagaoka, I probably said that wrong, it's a Japanese made cartridge, um, MP110 is the model, and he was bang on right, wow, that blew the Ortophone cartridge out of the water, uh, it blew it off the table anyways, <laughs> and um, you could spend two or three times the amount of money for this thing uh, than, than what you would have in this, and um, it's still, this would probably be a better cartridge, I'm really impressed with it. So on Onwards, so there's our signal chain. We go into a, my custom phono preamp. It's a 6N2P, which is, um, some people call this the Russian 6AX7. That's the tube. 
I designed and built it around um, the 6N2P because frankly uh, vintage, affordable vintage, low noise 12SN7s, 12, <laughs> 12AX7s. You'll see in a minute, we're going to be talking a lot about 6 and 12 SN7s. Um, they've 12 AX7s, vintage ones have become really expensive. It's tough to find low noise ones. Then you've got to match them up. So I thought, let's work with a tube that's not commonly used. And it, this is a fabulous tube. You, um, this, In fact, you haven't seen this prototype phono preamp yet. But this was the... Um, prototype really for the dual power supply dual mono designs that came later that you have seen and eventually maybe you'll see this I've been I've been hesitant to show it because um, I wanted to make sure that the EQ was right and uh, I've settled it in it's it's I haven't touched the EQ now oh jeepers in a year and a half anyways a long time I'm quite happy with it so on the other side I have a digital side so I have um, uh, digital uh, DSD and PCM files, high-res files, and to play them I just have a simple DMP or digital music player, a nice one. This is an Astel and Kern ConCube. It plays PCM uh, up to 32-bit 384K, which is, you know, crazy. You don't need that resolution. Up to 24192 is um, perfectly adequate in my opinion. And it plays the reason I bought this particular player, they're expensive, but the reason I bought it is it plays DSD natively. What does that mean? Normally, uh, all these small players will convert the DST to, P to PCM before they convert it to analog. And that really, in my opinion, it just detracts completely from the purpose of having DSD in the first place. Uh, in this case, uh, the con takes the DSD and it'll play DSD up uh, up to 256, which is incredible amounts of resolution. Even uh, the original SACD, what they call DSD 64, has 10 times the resolution of CDs. 10 times. Imagine that. Anyways, um, I, I love playing DSD files. There's really a big difference between them and PS. Really well recorded high res PCM files sound amazing. There's, but the edge always goes to the DSD. Apples for apples. In fact, I think I've got one of the, I've got my con cube right here, just to show you. Let's see what's on it right now. Ah, yes, I've been listening to Nora Jones' fabulous Live at Ronnie Scott's. And many of you know I'm a big fan of small ensemble, uh, acoustic music, and um, and Nora Jones is one of my favorite singers, and um, and she, she's just there's something so unique about her voice and her articulate how how she how she's the speed at which she's she wants to sing is just she's always giving you that just a little tiny bit of an edge as she goes into that next note. It's just there's something very special about Nora Jones, very unique. Um, and of course, if you know who her father is, you, you, you know that she has quite a music legacy in her genes. Anyways, it's live at Ronnie Scott's, which is a, f a famous establishment. I believe it's in London, but you know, I didn't look that up. And I've got other recordings that were made years and years ago at Ronnie Scott's. Isn't that fun? Anyways, it's a beast. Um, and I think, you know, they, were not, they weren't intending that this would go in your pocket so you could have music while you went jogging down the street. I think what they were thinking is you could put your whole music library into a player, a source, and you could take it from home to work and from, uh, you know, work over to a friend's or to a cottage or whatever. Anyways, this has been fa it's expensive. Uh, I, I actually saved up for about six months and I waited for um, Black Friday sale last year. It's a great time to buy glasses and electronics. And uh, before I bought it, I showed my wife my stash of cash. <laughs> so I've got almost all the money saved up. <laughs> so um, so I was good. <laughs> it always pays to talk to your spouse before you spend a lot of cash. Anyways, um, I buy and sell bits and pieces of stuff. So, you know, audio gear and things like that. So I, I accumulate money sometimes. 
uh, then it drain it down again. Anyways, so that's the source input, digital and analog. Now from there, it goes into my control line stage preamplifier. It's a custom design. It's, it's you know dual power supply, dual mono, and it's either these are two different units. It's either a six or twelve SN seven. Um, preamp or it's the E80CC preamp. They're two different, I have two different preamps. I feature them both. The designs are, you know, available um, on my website in the information section and there, there, there are tube labs for each of these. And, you know, often it depends on who's ordering tubes. I sell a lot of uh, 6SN7 tubes, so I often have this preamp in the system just so that I can trial customers' tubes. Um, and this one is, um, is a very warm sounding preamp, nice detail, um, good bass, uh, gorgeous treble, but this one here has an amazing amount of detail and is fundamentally a very different sound. This is a little bit more analytical, probably a little more accurate. And with excellent detail comes an excellent soundstage. The soundstage on this preamp is just to die for. And um, often when I'm not busy using this one, I'll switch back to this one. I like them both. Um, so from my preamplifier, I drop into an integrated amp. The Wilsonton R8 is currently in the system. And the reason it's there is because I'm working my way eventually towards a review of it. But I'm testing customers' tubes. I'm selling a lot of tubes for the Wilsonton R8, and I can't pull it out of the system uh, every day of the week. I'm sending, um, I'm often sending full sets to R8 owners, uh, which is a real pleasure. It's a nice amp, a really nice uh, for the money. It's a fabulous amp, and it's nice to send uh, great sets of tubes, good sounding tubes to to customers and hear back from them. I just heard back from. Uh, a good customer in Australia, and um, I sent her, well, I've sent her quite a few tubes, but I sent her um, a gorgeous set of uh, Muller, vintage Muller 1960s XF2s, and uh, she's really enjoying them. So, so what I'm running right now um, is Svetlana EL34s, which I absolutely adore. Very warm sounding tube, if you like vocals, mid-range, small ensemble, you're going to love this too. And also running um, the Svetlana 6, 6550C, which is basically a KT88. And this tube has also an amazing amount of soundstage. You combine these two or these two, um, just magic. Um, the soundstage is just absolutely fabulous. A little bit more lower punch. Um, more clarity and detail. A different tube. Very, you know, the comparisons are very similar from here and from here to here. And of course you can mix and match. You could put a very uh, detailed preamp tube up with a warmer sounding power tube. And I've, I've done it all different ways and they all sound good, you know. So in the preamp side I'm using, right now I'm using Sylvania 6SL7 GTs from the 1950s, just like the melts tubes. And the reason I'm running Sylvania's right now is because it's really hard to keep the melts tubes in stock. In fact, I've got um, a customer who's been waiting 10 days for a matched pair of noodle stock tubes. And I said, that's it. It's, that's long enough. I'm going to give him my set. And um, I, I think it's fair. And um, the benefit, of course, is that they've been burnt in and I know that they're, the tubes are, are running good. So that, that'll be a good thing to do. And it, it forces me to try another really great sounding 6SL7. And these are wonderful. In fact, Sylvania tubes from the 1950s and 60s, they're, they're, that's top drawer stuff, folks. Some of the best tubes ever made, in my opinion. And in the uh, phase inverter stage, I've run almost from the beginning, I'm running Sylvania 6S and 7 GTBs. A really good tube in that slot. Um, you could run the GTA. So audiophiles prefer the GTA. They're a bit more money. I just sell a lot of the GTBs, so I'm, I often have a pair in there, and they're basically burning in, and I'm testing them. Now, with tube gear, except for the very 
highest power tube gear, speaker efficiency is absolutely critical. In fact, the input source material is primary. It's, it's, it's primary. If you don't have good music going into your system, you can't fix it later on. That's it. You're done. You're finished right bef <laughs> before you even start building your stereo system. Um, but after that come the speakers. Now, back in the day when I was a budding audiophile, we put money into, into tables and we bought lots of records, but a lot of us didn't know that much, you know, between one quality record and another, and CDs hadn't been invented. I mean, FM radio had just been invented when I was getting into music, so, um, or at least it had become popular. The FM stations were opening up and getting going. Anyways, speakers after source material, absolutely critical. So I'm running... Uh, custom open baffles. Now open baffles are just um, uh, front panel speakers basically with no box. They're boxless speakers. There's The speaker is literally open in the back. There may be some wings that help uh, with the uh, overall sound, uh, but basically you have uh, a flat plate and you can also call an open baffle a dipole. Um, so I'm, I'm running a nominal efficiency of four, a nominal impedance of four ohms with a, not with a, with an approximate efficiency of 93 dB, which is quite high, and that's great for tube gear. I built about, oh, I don't know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I forget. I built about 12 prototype open baffle designs. Some of them only lasted 20 minutes, and eventually I settled on. Um, the drivers and the layout and the design that I really liked and um, I think I made one major upgrade. I found a better woofer. I found, um, I, I was lacking a little bit in bass and I found 14 inch Hammond organ, a pair of matched Hammond organ paper coned woofers and they are glorious. They're high efficiency for a woofer. They're very efficient. And they really made the speed. That was, that filled in the last piece of the puzzle. Now, what I haven't talked about is cables. So, this is what I use. I use Blue Jeans. Uh, this is a Belden cable, very high quality cable. It's a low capacitance cable. Blue Jeans is based in Seattle, Washington State, um, US. And they make basically custom cables, but at a very reasonable price. You can order pretty much any kind of cable you would ever dream up for audio use anyways. Uh, and for um, for home theater use, you know, HDMI cables, things like that. And for the money, these things are they're almost a steal, honestly. And the service from uh, Blue Jeans is absolutely fabulous. Um, and they're not far from me. I'm in the Pacific Northwest as well. I can't drive there, unfortunately. I love to visit them. I can't cross the border though. Um, but anyways, they they ship rapidly up to me. And the thing that I really wanted to talk about is how everything interrelates. So mark your cables in, or in my case, I know my cables are all the same, but mark them in, put a C1, C2, so cable one, cable two, or I1, I2 for interconnect, whatever you're doing. Now, when I first started blocking things in, I right away I would see, oh, I would say, how is this? How is my digital music player, how is that connected up to the preamp? What is that piece of junk of a cable? Oh, it is a piece of junk of a cable. Once you start writing stuff down, you start to realize what you've got in place. And I ordered, um, Blue Jeans actually made me up a cable that goes uh, one eighth to uh, a pair of RCAs, because I'm using the, the line out on this, on this music player. And, um, it's a wonderful cable, and it's the only odd cable in the system. Down here, speaker cables are important as well, and I've actually custom made my own cables, but I, a friend of mine who's an audiophile was selling uh, a very affordable price, some solid, um, you know, high quality copper, uh, 12 gauge twisted cables, and um, they're, they're made by a guy in the States, uh, made to order. Solid cables, um, 
can be rolled up into a bundle, but you can't bend those suckers. You can sort of bend them a little bit, but um, they're a real pain in the ass. I couldn't bring them on camera because it was such a pain in the ass to disconnect them. But the sound is just out of this world. They they definitely edged out my my uh, heavy gauge uh, custom build, which were nice cables uh, and didn't cost a lot. Someday maybe I'll feature those. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is get the whole system down and then stand back and as you're creating your block diagram you will see where you've got your weak links. I guarantee it. Anyways, it's worked for me. So that, that was fun. A whole bunch of interesting tubes have come in. Let's have a quick look at them. I've got this one out just for fun. Um, it looks like a tube but it's not a tube. So at first I thought this was Tarzan but it's actually Tarz Tarzian, something like that. And this is an early um, solid state silicon rectifier diode. Let's pop it open. Look at the size of that thing. And it's got a standard um, uh, four pin. That's a, uh, uh, you know, the same, it's the same socket that the 300B will take and, uh, and a whole bunch of actually direct heated triodes. And look at that, when you see a big, that's on there solid, you see a, a big uh, top connection, that's the anode. And this thing will take 10, it's a half wave rectifier diode, it'll take 10 kilovolts on the top. That's 10,000 volts. Woo wee. Uh, anyways, I, I bought a large collection of tubes and often you get miscellaneous stuff. So um, I thought you'd, You'd enjoy seeing that. I was surprised when I pulled it out and checked the specs. Um, we were talking earlier about, let's just back up a little bit. We were talking earlier about 6SL7s. And here's a Sylvania Jan 12SL7, just like the one I was telling you about that I'm running in my system, only the 12 volt version. And it's not a direct sub. You'd have to change the heater voltage. But I, I collect these because the um, Vintage 1952s, 1950s tubes are getting very rare, very expensive. It's hard to find. It's getting harder and harder to find new old stock. Period. So most of them are used, and um, and because I build my own equipment, if I ever build an amp that needs a 6SL7 in the driver stage, um, or in the any stage, um, I can set the heater voltage for 12 volts. That's the only difference. They're the same tube. Um, but look at the, isn't that beautiful? And check out the box. Packed on May 1945. So this is uh, probably World War II surplus. And so this is a World War II vintage tube. Um, and a bunch that came in. I'm going to put them in the store. Hopefully by the weekend they'll be in. What's that? What else came in? A whole bunch of new old stock and some used uh, 5U4 rectifiers. We were just talking about rectifiers a second ago. These are full wave. You see that? You've got, you see the, the two plate assemblies here? That When you see that, you know right away it's a full wave uh, rectifier diode. And this is a really nice one. This Toshiba is the brand name, but the uh, parent company is Tokyo Sh Shibara, I think, electric. I can't say that right. Hopefully I didn't um, insult any of my Japanese viewers. But they, for obviously reasons they use the Toshiba brand name, it's people recognized it as, as quality electronics. And the, uh, quite a few new old stock uh, 5U4s came in and there. Um, you know, it's it always surprises me how many new old stock tubes are hiding out there. Um, and I think, oh yeah, I saved the best to last. Hang on. Take a look at these. Just have a look at this. Oh, mouse ears. These circular micas, that's what they're called. And when you see that, you know that it is a Acrad tube? No, <laughs> that's a rebrand. These big tall things, that's a tongue saw, and this is one of the favorite 6SN7s, um, 6SN7 tongue saws out there. People love these tubes. They're really impossible to keep in stock, and only a, 
only a few mouse ears showed up. Um, and to be honest with you, I can't tell the difference between the the more common tongue saw, same size tube, L angle plates in the later version. Uh, they, they all sound really wonderful. In my opinion, they've got a, maybe a slight edge on the Sylvania tube. Um, very similar sounding tube, great sounding tube. People love the tongue saws. And uh, here's a smaller version of it. Remember, tubes got smaller as time went on because they needed to fit into uh, things like TV sets and the, they were really space confined. And basically, they made a more efficient package. You get the same basic tube and they really sound the same. They're all great sounding tubes. And tongue cells have really unique micas. You see the teeth on that? There's a few manufacturers that had that, uh, but the pattern of the of the mica on the tongue cells makes them easy to identify when you compare them to, you know, properly labeled ones. Anyways, a bunch of these came in. Uh, they'll be in the store on the weekend. And if you stayed till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of twenty dollars and free shipping on orders of one hundred and fifty dollars or more after discount. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.